Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our current edition of Medicaid Monday, our second of 2024. And last year we did 12 full sessions and you can find all of those posted on our website. We are gonna be repeating the important ones, but we're gonna be creating some new content as well as we go through the next 11 months, including today. And with me, I have our Medicaid expert, Frank Hemming. Good morning, Frank. Hello. Or good afternoon, I should say. And this is our firm, our 16 current attorneys. We have one more that just joined us today. So we are currently at 17 and we do practice across most of New York State. We are in Massachusetts, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Florida. But our primary practice is helping clients with their planning, including Medicaid and elder law planning right here in New York State. So I went the wrong way. There we go. Today's agenda, <clears throat> Frank's going to recap the 2024 Medicaid numbers and a little update on those. We're going to talk about the lexicon of Medicaid and spousal Medicaid, all of the different acronyms that we throw around. And I've argued Medicaid before the courts, all the way up to the Court of Appeals, where I've appeared twice on Medicaid cases. And the judges actually started throwing around MMMNA and even MIMNA. I said, wow, that's, that's pretty astute for the judge to have the, the MIMNA reference. But we'll talk about that. Spousal protections, when one spouse needs Medicaid and the other has to protect income, how do we do that? What about resources? How do we protect one spouse's resources if the other spouse needs to get Medicaid? Fair hearing rights, because some of this ends up in fair hearing. Some of this ends up in family court, although I can tell you we haven't been to court on a Medicaid case in, well, probably seven years, six or seven years. So it's been quiet on the litigation front in terms of Medicaid issues, which is good news, I suppose. And then we're going to talk about something called spousal refusal, which in New York State is something that the governor has tried to, not just this governor, but all past governors, for 26 years, the elimination of spousal refusal has been on the docket, but it has been knocked off. And they are 0 for 26 so far with regard to spousal refusal. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how to plan for it. So, Frank, you're on. Easy. Uh, so we talked about this last month. We're going to probably do this when we recap every Medicaid Monday. So for this year, so far, we have no increase from last year. So $16.97 a month if you're a single individual applying for Medicaid at home, $22.88 if you're a couple, your community spouse resource allow your community spouse income allowance, right? The MMMNA, which we'll do a lot of today, <laughs> talking about that number and throwing a lot of numbers at you. That did increase the $138 up from $37.15.50 up to $38.53.50. And the community or the Medicaid spouse in the nursing home allowance of $50, that remained the same. Uh, so that's all for income. So essentially no real change unless you're that community spouse. So not a lot to remember or update so far. <laughs> So the, the nursing home income allowances and the home care income allowances are very, very different. So know that that $50 has been there for as long as I've practiced law, which is 40 years, that has been the nursing home income allowance. It hasn't gone up. And from that $50, you're expected to pay for haircuts and slippers and things that you need living in the nursing home. But that's what the spouse gets in the nursing home. That's what an individual gets. If they don't have a spouse, it is a $50 income allowance. And then again, for resources so far, not really much of a change. $38,182, right? For one, spat, for one person on Medicaid, for a couple both needing Medicaid at home, it goes up to $40,821, same as it was last year. And then we have our CSRA, or our Community Spouse Resource Allowance, where the lower limit stayed at $74,820. Upper limit went up just a little bit. So the upper limit is that 154, 140 number that's down in that footnote. So we're going to go through a little bit of why that matters and how that all works. Uh, in this presentation, a lot of times we kind of just reference these numbers without diving into them, but we're going to talk more about these today. And then quickly, we will mention that the federal poverty numbers have been uh, at least released. I don't think they were published, or at least last time I checked, they were not published. So we're waiting for New York to probably update these numbers a little bit where we're going to see some likely modest increases, not nearly the jump that we saw between 22 and 23, where they almost doubled. But as soon as we know them, we'll update you guys on the next Medicaid Monday. So a little bit of historical reference. These laws have grown up since 1965. 
And in New York State, Medicaid became, it's kind of a joke, Medicaid became a verb. Oh, there's a new federal program. Let's medicate it. And so New York brought every possible Medicaid program into the state during those early years. And now, to some extent, is maybe paying a price for it because of the costs. Over time, the rights of individuals, including spouses, have changed. And there are federal guidelines. There are ranges for the community spouse resource allowance. There are different methods of calculating spousal income. We are talking today about New York State. No other state has the formula that you see at the bottom of your screen, which was put in place by Governor Pataki because there was an increasing allowance for community spouse resources. The minimum threshold is much lower than that 74820, but New York locked it in and it's been locked in for many years. The upper limit, the upper range is 50% of the couple's combined assets. And if that 50% is greater than 74,820, that becomes the resource allowance. They couldn't make it any more complicated if they wanted to or try. <laughs> so we'll work you through these and we'll try to give you some examples, but the numbers are a little bit hard. They're gonna bounce around, but the minimum CSRA number, the Community Spouse Resource Allowance is 74,820, hasn't changed in years, but the upper limit, the upper bracket has. That's gone up a little bit. So. With that, Frank. And then we have our regional rates. Again, we just wanted to show that there was some modest increases for these. These are most important when we're calculating penalty periods. Currently, we only do that for nursing home cases. If we have the uh, look back period instituted for community Medicaid, like we've been talking about since 2020, these will come into play for community applications as well. But for now, again, just information, these did jump up a little bit for your penalty calculations for nursing. So Northeastern New York, $13,235. So when you apply for nursing home care, and if someone has transferred assets within that five-year look back for nursing home care, they're going to apply a penalty based upon the value of aggregated transfers. You add up everything you gave away over those five years, and you divide that by this number, the divisor given to us by New York State as the regional rate for nursing home care of $13,235. It's not the private pay rate, Frank. What is that now? I would say generally between 15 to 17,000 if you're in the capital district. So you're paying a little bit more than they're giving you in terms of the penalty calculation. So just know that when you go and you do have to divide all of the aggregated transfers for the five years prior to nursing home admission, this is the number that you're going to use as the divisor. Frank? So acronyms, like we love acronyms. We say them all the time. We don't usually think about trying to explain them just because we use them so commonly. So today you're gonna hear quite a few. So first one is that minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance or your MINNA. That's the amount of money that your spouse can have when there's one spouse on Medicaid, one spouse in the community. Your CSRA or your community spouse resource allowance, that's the amount of assets that the Spouse in the in the community, right? The non-applying Medicaid spouse, that's the amount of assets or resources they can have. Your personal needs allowance, that's the amount of money that can be retained by the Medicaid applicant, whether it's home care or nursing home, just depends on how what that number is. For nursing home, it's that $50 that Lou mentioned. For, for community, if you're doing the spousal shift, I believe it's $591, but we'll check that out in a slide or two. And then that bottom one, the community spouse monthly income allowance. That's the amount of money that could be shifted from Medicaid spouse to community spouse to bring them up to that minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance number. So sorry for the acronyms. Hopefully this helps just kind of set a context of what they are, but we'll try to make sure that we're clear as we go through them because the next slides, they do get a little wordy and there are, there are a lot of numbers. This is the introduction to alphabet soup. <laughs> and we're gonna go through the meanings and the numbers and how it all works. And hopefully by the end of this half hour, you'll have an understanding of what those letters mean. So Frank, if one spouse is applying for Medicaid, there are these spousal impoverishment rules in place to protect the non-applicant spouse. And we, we refer to the non-applicant spouse as either the community spouse or the well spouse. Yeah. So it's the person who is healthy or semi-healthy and still living in the community. Remember, that could include assisted living because that's still living in the community. It's not in a nursing home. 
And we're going to talk about people living at home with spouses in the nursing home and well spouses living at home with their spouse needing home health care. Again, this law has evolved and has layer upon layer of regulation. In 1998, the legislation was expanded because the impoverished spouse was said to be living a life of destitution. And that was true. Spouses were allowed to keep no additional assets and they had to spend everything down if they were unlucky enough to have their spouse need to qualify for Medicaid. One topic that we're not going to talk about today is divorce because it became routine back then for spouses to get divorced, to have to separate assets and to try to get assets into the hands of a spouse who may be in their 60s or 70s and need to live a full life expectancy without becoming a ward of the state. That was the genesis of the spousal impoverishment protections and community spouses now have these additional amounts, the MMMNA, the CSRA, and we'll, we're gonna talk about where these things apply, Frank, but it used to be that they only applied in nursing home cases or specific types of home care, but it's been expanded at this point. Yeah, so now we're lucky that we have people that are under uh, a waiver, right? So we have the waivers like the nursing home transition diversion waiver, which we do a lot of work with, mm -hmm. Uh, which comes to mind whenever you hear a wavered service in my mind, but it also is, was expanded to include managed long-term care. So in general terms, right, when we're talking Medicaid at home, we're generally talking about either managed care with a MMLTC. We're talking about the CDPAP program, again, which comes kind of under the umbrella of MLTC or a waiver. And all of these spousal protections apply to all of those people. So you have those increased protections for both people in nursing homes and the vast majority of people getting home care as well. I'm just gonna go back a few slides to remind you of what we were looking at here in terms of resources. And, and Frank, this never made sense to anyone, but the community, the couple's resource allowance for home care is- Yeah, that 40,000, 40, 40, So an individual gets 30,000 and you get an extra 10,000 for the spouse. And that's it. Who's well and needs to live at home and has to pay bills and expenses and their own living, cover their own living costs. And we don't know how long they're going to live. Mm -hmm. So the expansion of that additional resource allowance and income allowance to people who are not in nursing homes, but to people whose spouse is living at home and the other spouse is receiving care at home became very, very important. So this is what you were just talking about, Frank. This is the slide that I should have had up that uh, is covering the various programs that benefit from the enhanced community spouse or spousal protections that have been enacted and expanded over time. So let's dig in to these two numbers because these are kind of the two fundamental numbers that we have to know and have to know how to, to deal with. And I can tell you that they are nuanced. It isn't just a static number. There are all kinds of things going on around these numbers. The MMMNA, Minimum Monthly Maintenance Needs Allowance, also known as the MIMNA, and the Community Spouse Resource Allowance, the CSRA, which we sometimes refer to as the CISRA. So I never call it that. No. <laughs> so what is the MMMNA? So it's the income allowance, which allows a married applicant mm -hmm. to transfer part or all of their income to the non-applying spouse. So that's your community spouse or your well spouse when they earn less than the amount of money they're totally allowed to have. So right now, the MIMNA is $3,853.50 for the community spouse, right? That was the one where we saw that little bit of jump up for the 100 for the hundred or so dollars from last year. So it went up from 37.15.50 last year up to 38.53.50. So this is the amount of total income the community spouse can have, whether it's their income or it's their income plus some of their spouses that's receiving that. So the question becomes, what if the spouse's income is more than the MMMNA, the well spouse? And what if it's less? And so we look at the allocation of income from the ill spouse or Medicaid spouse to the well spouse. Right, so we did an example here. 
So let's say the community spouse's income is $2,000 a month. So that's your well spouse living at home. They make $2,000 a month of their own, their pension, their social security, their IRA money, whatever it is. If the Medicaid spouse's income is $5,000, right? We have to look at, well, where does the community spouse's income fall in? They're below that 38.53.50 per month number. So what they do is they allow the Medicaid spouse to contribute $1,853.50 to the what to the community spouse. That's that CSMIA number. That's the amount of money that can be shifted from from Medicaid spouse to community spouse to bring that community spouse up to that $38.53.50 number. So if we do the math here, we bring community spouse up to $38.53.50, and then the Medicaid spouse's mm -hmm. income gets reduced by the amount of money they shifted. Theirs goes down to $3,146.50. That's all that bottom result on the slide. Mm -hmm. So again, this is what happens when the well spouse has less income then the allowance, the MMMNA allowance, we get an allocation of the Medicaid spouse's income over to that well spouse. Then the question becomes, what if the well spouse's income is more? And what if the community spouse, or the, excuse me, the Medicaid spouse has significant income? And we're gonna see how that impacts this. If they have a lot of excess income, this may not be our best route to take. Yeah. So when you have a community spouse that makes more than that $38.53 number, right, they usually are just going to use spousal refusal, which we're going to talk about later in the program. So this is talking about a different kind of piece to this. So if you have that, you, if you have a scenario where you've got a Medicaid spouse getting benefits, you have a community spouse, right, that doesn't make nearly as much as they can under that allowance, we're going to shift some of those numbers. The other piece of the the other piece of the equation is well, how much money can the Medicaid spouse keep? That's that personal needs allowance, the PNA. So the PNA, when you do a spousal shift like this, is five hundred ninety one dollars for twenty twenty four, and that number is the difference between the one person household that sixteen ninety seven and the two person household, which is the twenty two eighty eight. So if you do the numbers, it comes out to five ninety one difference. So again, if we're using the example on the slide, right? We have we have the Medicaid spouse enrolls with MLTC after approval. They've got $2,500 a month of income. Their spouse has $1,648.50 of theirs, considerably less than the MMMNA. So what we're going to do, we're going to shift money over from Medicaid spouse to community spouse. That's the 2205. Bring that community spouse up to 3853. And then the result then is that we have our Medicaid spouse only has $295 left after the shift. They're not above 591. They have no spend down. So now we have both spouses right where they need to be. Everybody gets Medicaid, no spend downs. We're good. And if you slept through math class like I did, <laughs> you may want to go back and refresh yourself. You'll have these slides. This gets very complicated and convoluted when you start running different permutations of a plan right. and look at the various options. So we're hopeful that these slides can help unravel a lot of these rules for you. But here we are with another spousal situation where the spouse has more income. Yeah, so now we up the income quite a bit because that was kind of the good scenario. But we don't usually see the good scenario very often because that 591 is such a low number. So let's change the numbers a little bit. Let's change some facts. So here we have our Medicaid spouse with substantial income, $6,500. Spouse still has the same low number. We have one income, one spouse that makes a lot, another spouse that makes considerably less. So if we do that spousal shift, so we, we still shift that 2205 number. Well, now we have our Medicaid spouse with a remainder of their income of 4295, almost $4,300. That's way more than that 591 number. So they've got a spend down now of $3,704 a month, which they'd have to then spend down every month to get on Medicaid. Now, you, they could do that, right? Because in that instance, we have Medicaid spouse is getting the 591, community spouse gets the, the 3853, and we get Medicaid. That's a good result. But the better result here is the one that's bolded on the bottom, where if we do just a little bit of tinkering with the budgeting at the county level, which is why people like to use attorneys like us when they do this, instead of asking for budgeting for a household of two in this instance, we're going to say we only want budgeting for the Medicaid spouse on their own. 
where then we can have them use their pooled trust for their excess income, where they have that 40, 4803 number of excess income above 1697. Now we can divert it to a pooled trust. We can save it all. That's a much better scenario for everyone involved. And we're going to talk about pool trusts next month. March 11th is the next Medicaid Monday, and pool trusts will be the topic. We're going to have Sarah Grimes from the NYSARC Pool Trust back to talk about pool trust establishment and administration. But now let's talk a little bit about the assets, Frank. Yeah, so I feel like in some ways this is a little easier to comprehend just generally. I don't think it's as many moving pieces. So for your, so for your CSRA, again, that's the amount of assets that that community spouse can have. Lower limit, 74, 820, been that way for years, or half of this of the shared assets up to 154, 140, like Lou said, right at the top of the program. So this is why, generally speaking, when we're doing our Medicaid programs, when we're going to fall at a number for CSRA, I love to just stick with the bottom number, 74, 820, because we know that. That one's always in stone, no matter what happens, no questions asked. Community spouse can always have that. So that's that just goes into a little bit of where that what that number is and why we like to use the one that we do. And the good news is there are other options if they have more assets than that. So if we have assets that are more than twice the 74820, we can preserve additional assets, but usually we're using other techniques in order to do that. So this is the resource allowance. It's not a huge amount of money. If you're a 70-year-old spouse whose spouse has Parkinson's or Alzheimer's and you need to live the rest of your natural life expectancy on that amount of assets, you're going to have some issues and you're going to run out of money very, very quickly. So let's just take a quick example, Frank, of how those numbers may play out. Sure. So let's pretend we have a couple. We need Medicaid for one. Other spouse is healthy. They come in. They, this is what they have. They have 100000 in cash, 150 in stock, CDs for 25000 and exempt house. Doesn't count, right? Because somebody's in the house. So you total all that up. That brings it to $275,000. The spousal share is half, right? So <laughs> half of that is $137,500. So we plug that back kind of into our formula. We start with 275,000. We take out the spousal share, what the community spouse is allowed to have. So they take out their half. And then we take out the Medicaid allowance that's allowed for the Medicaid spouse of 30,182. So you do the math. Now we have total excess resources of $107,318. So this is one of the reasons why we don't like to use this type of plan because this still means that we've got to get rid of $107,000 before somebody gets Medicaid with the community spouse having amounts of money in this, in this, in these amounts. And that's not a great scenario. Again, remember, if this is a home care case, this is in an irrelevant number because there is no look back or penalty period. So they can transfer excess resources and still apply for Medicaid home care. If it's a nursing home case, then your options, if depending upon who you talk to, um, and if anybody from DSS is on the line, I apologize. But a lot of times our clients come back to us and say, well, they told me I had to spend $107,318. Or if you talk to a nursing home, well, you have to spend $107,318 because that's the most money they're going to get on a private pay basis. But the truth is that you want to look around for exempt transfers. You might want to put an addition on the house. You might want to do some things to spend that money down. And in the worst case scenario, you're going to do something called a rule of halves transfer. And you can preserve half of that $107,000 in the worst case scenario by doing some planning. So you want to consult at this point. If you have excess resources, certainly you need to get a consultation and look at what the available options are for that plan. And there are options. So let's take a look, Frank, at something that I do, I used to do a lot of, <laughs> and that is we used to go to fair hearing quite a bit. And we used to go to family court and seek orders of support. The law allows a well spouse to get an additional income allowance. This was far more important when we had the lower income allowances before spousal impoverishment budgeting, but I am that old. And so when we looked at the ability to increase the income of the community spouse, the well spouse, what factors are allowed in? And the case law used to be very favorable and they used to allow a standard of living to be the, the measuring stick. That was taken away by the New York State Court of Appeals. Now it has to be some type of emergency or health-related expense. So the one place that this becomes relevant 
in my experience, and, and there are other situations, is if the will spouse is in an assisted living facility and wants to stay out of the nursing home, and let's say the assisted living facility costs $6,000 a month, the income allowance is $38,53.50, they can get an additional income allowance. You can increase the MIMNA, the MMMNA, to $6,000 a month, and then pull more income from the well spouse over to pay for that assisted living facility. If that person needs care, there may be a way to get that through the fair hearing or through the family court. What if their assets that produce the income to get up to that $6,000 a month enhanced MMMNA, we can actually increase the CSRA in addition to the MMMNA. I haven't seen a lot of these fair hearings lately. They are there out there. One of the, they, they are? Yes. I, I went and looked at you because I hadn't seen them either. So I just checked. I think I found at least several within the past two or three years mm -hmm. where that's the exact kind of tactic that they use was instead of, let, instead of just saying, let's give more CSRA, it was actually let's increase CSRA with the goal of actually increasing or getting that spouse up to the MMMNA. Yep. And usually they would use like annuities where then they would have an annuity company come in and actually say, well, if you took this amount of resource, turned it into an, into an immediate annuity, you could kick off this amount of income and then increase the amount of income for that community spouse. But one of the reasons that we haven't had to use those fair hearings as often is that spousal refusal is still allowed. And spousal refusal in New York State, as I said earlier, has been around for a very long time. New York State doesn't like it. The governor has tried to abolish it, but it survives. And it survives for some very, very good reasons. But what it allows us to do is to just say no. So if we have assets that are in either spouse's name, we can transfer those assets to the well spouse, to the community spouse. And we sign a, it's a one page, one paragraph, two sentence piece of paper saying that I cannot afford to turn over my income and assets to support my spouse. The county or state can enforce that. They can come seeking contributions, but they can't say no. They cannot refuse Medicaid eligibility to the spouse that is in the nursing home or the spouse that needs home health care. So it's a simple statement, <clears throat> but a very powerful one. Frank, it works. Every time it does. I mean, it does open the avenues on the slide for either support or, and or recoupment. So whenever we kind of counsel clients on whether we want to use spousal refusal, it always comes with some risk. It all kind of depends on how litigious the county where you are is and how likely they are to actually put these motion, these wheels into motion to seek these avenues. But a lot of times it's going to put the Medicaid applicant and the community spouse in a better position. To, re to actually use spouse or refusal and kind of roll the dice, if you will, rather than take the 107,000 and just immediately spend it down like we were looking at a few slides ago. Because if, there, if, they, if the county or the other agent or the Medicaid agency doesn't come after the spouse, right, then that's a lot more money that could be sitting with the community spouse rather than having been spent down. So counties used to be much more aggressive at pursuing <coughs> recovery from the community spouse. And I recall a day that I was in, I think it was Rensselaer County, and I had three fair hearings scheduled for that day with three spouses, women, all women who are over the age of 85, who I was sitting with in kind of the general population of Rensselaer County Department of Social Services. And I'm sitting there with my three clients waiting to go in for these fair hearings. I haven't been to one in probably 10 years. So spousal refusal works and it keeps our clients in a position where they can keep assets, keep income, and still have the ability to live their lives and pay their expenses as they go through. So planning for home care is a whole different game, Frank. Yeah, we have no, as you said, like Lou kind of gave this away already. We don't have any look back periods. We don't have penalty periods. So if we're faced with a scenario where we have to refuse, it might make sense just to transfer the assets into either a trust, or to a family member, or to an exempt transfer, where we don't have to utilize spouse or refusal, and then we still get Medicaid almost immediately for the for the community for the for the person in the community needing Medicaid without putting spousal refusal even on the table. So we counsel families every day through this process. You have to get a very thorough picture. We have a great fact finder to get all of the information. If you miss a detail, 
it's going to throw your plan off. You have to know what every element of income is, every asset, how the assets are structured, how the assets are, are held. And Frank, we have certain exceptions that we just might want to throw on the table right now. One of them being IRAs. And if uh, I'll give you a little foreshadowing of our future program, IRAs are exempt in New York State if they are in periodic payment status. That means if you're drawing on those IRAs, the IRA itself is exempt, but you have income, right? That has to be factored into this equation. So when you sit down and you're counseling families through this process, is it better to create a trust and shift excess resources into the trust before applying for Medicaid home care? Is it better to shift everything to the well spouse and have the well spouse then sign a spousal refusal to get Medicaid home care? And the big question that, that arises and that people that are in the know think about, what if that spouse needs a nursing home within the five year look back? Mm -hmm. So if we do a Medicaid trust and we're creating Medicaid eligibility for home care because there is no look back or penalty, but a year from now, that spouse has to go into the nursing home. And now we have a five year look back and four year waiting period based upon the transfers into the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Frank, what do we do? We revoke the trust. We put everything back. We then utilize spousal refusal by shifting everything to the well spouse and getting Medicaid on board for the nursing home without really any weight other than how long it took us to undo all the planning that was done for community purposes. So we can actually do the Medicaid plan with a trust and then unwind the trust if we need nursing home care. If it's nursing home care at the origin or in, the, in that five year look back period, we put the assets into the well spouse's name, we do spousal refusal, and we then have an opportunity to do something called a post eligibility transfer. Once the Medicaid applicant spouse is deemed eligible for Medicaid, there is no restriction on the community spouse transferring assets to that trust. There is no impact on the Medicaid applicant there is a five-year look back for the well spouse, but hopefully they can last through that five-year time period. So the post-eligibility plan is kind of this capstone, if you will, on a spousal refusal or on a Medicaid uh, nursing home application. 